Welcome, hello everyone, come on in. Welcome, welcome, we're just admitting people into our beautiful virtual room that we have here. Um, hello, hi everyone. You have entered a MOFAD virtual program. Welcome, just letting, letting all the folks in. Um, if this is your first time at a MOFAD program, it's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And if this is not your first time, it's wonderful to have you back. So welcome back either way. Uh, we love doing virtual programs because we get to connect with people from all over. Uh, we have we have panelists tonight who are coming in from different places. Jennifer is coming in from Vancouver. Simran's coming in from DC. I'm in New York. Um, my name is Sari. I'm the Public Programs Director of MOFAD, Museum of Food and Drink. Um, I would love to hear where you're from. So if you want to type in the chat and, and tell us where you're watching from, that would be really exciting to, to know where you're all watching from. Um, so this is the second of our series of a three-part virtual series. Yes, hello, profound in the house. Um, Fruiting Bodies that Simran, our uh, wonderful moderator and curator, um, put together for us. So we're so excited to have part two of this Fruiting Bodies series. Lots of fun places showing up on the chat. Um, so I hope, you know, some of you came to the first part. We have one more part. This is the second of three, and that will be next month. Um, so it's so exciting to have Simran back and of course be with Jennifer Dow. She's the co-founder and lead mycologist of Forage Mushrooms, a local cultivation supply and functional mushroom company. She is a biologist and fungi lover with a degree in microbiology and years of laboratory experience. And of course we have Simran Seiji back, um, a multimedia journalist, academic, consultant and the author of Bread, Wine, Chocolate, The Slow Loss of Foods We Love, an amazing book uh, that you should absolutely read. Her current research is focused on exploring ways to dismantle systems of oppression in support of the biocultural diversity of sacred plant medicines and the communities and lands that steward them. That is a mouthful, but I love saying it because it is such a beautiful sentence. Simran is the founder of the Asian Psychedelic Collective, an evolving space of belonging and support for Asians working with and in psychedelics. Uh, so I am going to turn it over to them and just want to let you know that, you know, the chat is open as you saw, so you're welcome to comment throughout and then there'll be time for a little Q&A at the end and you can use the chat function for that as well. So take it away, Simran, Jennifer, thank you so much. Sari, thank you so much. I'm so uh, grateful to you for saying yes uh, and giving us this platform to elevate this series of conversations um, on understanding mushrooms. If you haven't um, seen that beautiful conversation I had with Juliana Furci, I encourage finding that in the MoFAD archives. And then tonight, shedding light on the longer, deeper narratives around mushrooms and their centuries old history in Asia. So long before the kind of like global north mushroom boom that we're now witnessing. And I think that's part of part and parcel of sort of the bigger conversation around um, the, the folks who are maybe erased or undervalued or underlooked in, um, in the, not only conversations around food, but conversations around medicine. So that ties into, um, psychedelics as well and psychedelic mushrooms. Mushrooms are super exciting to me because of all the things they do. They heal us, they clothe us, they nourish us, they connect us, they can kill us, they can transform us. They help us address social and environmental challenges. Um, they can be used as food, medicine, building materials, textiles, packaging. They break down plastics. They can be used as a pesticide. Um, they can help us eliminate environmental toxins. And we think that we're the uh, more evolved species, right? So they've been so humbling to me. They've been extraordinary teachers. Um, and tonight we will learn more about them from Jennifer uh, Doe, who is the senior mycologist at Forage. And um, Jennifer, I would love to start off talking about sort of how we connected, which was through a podcast where you were speaking about Asia's relationship with mushrooms. And I mean, you know this, cause I've said it to you directly when I reached out, I was so grateful to finally hear someone speaking about the obvious. So thank you again for, for the research that you've done. Can you just start off telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so thanks so much for that introduction, Simran, um, and thanks for hosting, sorry. Um, 
So yeah, my journey into mushrooms and mycology, it's, it certainly has been like a winding kind of curved road. It wasn't a one straight path. Um, I, I kind of, I did a degree thinking in, in microbiology, thinking I was going to be going into medicine. So my understanding of, of how we heal ourselves is initially from a very clinical background. Um, I then went on to study and research bone marrow macrophages, so immune cells, working specifically with animal models, mouse models, and human models, just studying macrophages and and other types of cells um, in our bodies that are crucial to the immune response. Um, and then after all that, I thought, you know, the next path is really to pursue a PhD, but I don't, I didn't know if I wanted to go into academia at the time. During those years, I was foraging a lot. I was kind of going out into the woods. I was looking at mushrooms and fun fungi have always kind of captivated me, but I had a friend at the same time who had said like, have you ever considered looking at them under a microscope? I thought, hmm, that's weird. I would never really look at plants under a microscope because plant cells are so different to human cells and to animal cells. But um, no, my friend said, no, look at them under a microscope. So I did. And I started doing a little bit of my own experimentation. And I realized that a lot of these fungal cells behave so similar to the immune cells and the animal cells and human cells that I've been working with in the laboratory. They divide the exact same way. Um, you cultivate that them in a very similar way that you cultivate um, any type of animal cells and microbiology. So that was initially what had piqued my interest. Um, and then I then went on to kind of come to Vancouver and start my own um, company or help start it where, where we're really, really interested in introducing people to making that citizen science more accessible. So making cultivating mushrooms a little bit more accessible for people who look at it like this one big complicated process when really there's something really magical about it when you, you can make it easy. Um, and then while all of this was happening, I saw that mushrooms had become more and more trendy. So, I mean, you see it, it's so Instagrammable these days, you know, like you see mushroom art everywhere. Now you see functional mushroom supplements everywhere. And so it kind of just had come kind of full scale for me because I had grown up with my very, with, with my Chinese parents, essentially giving me a lot of these medicinal mushroom supplements, um, reishi, lion's mane, and they'd always been really astringent, bitter tasting, but that was just the, the household that I'd grown up in where, because I'm Asian and, you know, I don't want to generalize everybody from an Asian background, but really like for Chinese people, um, and for first generation immigrants, that background and the way that I grew up was like, any time that I had a cough, any time that I had a flu, any time I had like any kind of indigestion issues, the first answer wasn't to go to the doctor. The first answer was what kind of chi traditional Chinese remedy will there be in the household? And at the time, because I told you I'd kind of come from a clinical background in college, I always dismissed my parents' ways to kind of treat whatever like ailments that I had. And I'd always said, you know, like it's the clinical science, it's it's the Western medicine, this is all voodoo witchcraft. And now I look back in embarrassment because I'm working for a mushroom company. I'm very passionate about mushrooms. I'm starting to learn about all of the functional benefits that these medicinal medicines have. And it looks like the Western world is starting to cop onto it as well, because there's so much more research now about lion's mane and reishi that there wasn't before. But um yeah, sorry, that was a really, really long winded answer to your question, but that's that's essentially my journey. Yeah, no, that's so good. And you're touching into things, so many things, but I want to I want to highlight two of them. One, that idea that like our pharmacy was our kitchen cabinet, you know, I mean, um, South Asian, right? So Ayurveda was our version. And it's like, what this is, we're going to eat this food, you're going to take this herb, you're going to drink this tea. That's the front line. That's the first line of defense and healing. So um, that same experience you had of sort of saying, no, but West is best. Like we should take a pill. We shouldn't, I mean, what is this? I'm just eating another food. Like mm -hmm. none of that felt um, modern enough, you mm -hmm. know? And that's a willful thing. When we look across agriculture, that whole notion of like a monoculture field in the green revolution was really about instituting, you know, petrochemical inputs, forced irrigation, like all these processes that erased traditional knowledge. So, I mean, I'm just, I, there's part of me that loves that this is coming full circle and like 
the global north slash west is finally like coming on board. But what I'm, I know I and we are sort of like stunned by is the fact that there's a real erasure in, you know, in some of the history around this and some of the use of these um, you say fun, fun guy, I say fun guy, you know, um, all, as, the same. all good, right? Um, as like, as, as our medicines, as part of our lineage. So I'm curious, like, I mean, I just remember being in Shanghai and just being staggered by the amount of um, fungi that I saw. Like, I just was like, I can't, like, I've not seen this in my life, you know? And I'm just curious to know a little bit more about how that evolved for you and, and, you know, and like, why, like, why is there so much usage of fungi in, um, in Asia? Well, firstly, to point to your point about what you said about, you know, how, how the global West is coming on to starting to appreciate these, these trends in plant medicine that have been around in, in certain cultures for thousands and thousands of years. Like that's definitely something that I spend a lot of my time thinking about just because, it's kind of like, yes, over the last few years, mushrooms have become so trendy. Yes, now there's fantastic fungi, fungi on Netflix. Yes, there's mushroom supplements everywhere. But at the same time, as the West is awakening to all of this, I feel like so much of that history is like, we're not, a lot of us aren't seeing the full picture. Um, and because they're not seeing the full picture of who in in the world have been how people and specific people across the world have been using these mushrooms for such a long time, then that erasure is, yeah, I don't know. It, it can be really, really frustrating because um, we like, because I work for a medicinal mushroom and functional mushroom company, we get a lot of questions from, from, from our customers. Where do you source these mushrooms? Are they from China? If they're from China, I, I don't want to, I don't want to buy it. You know, I've heard that somebody ate Chinese mushrooms and all of a sudden they're sick. So it's just one of those things where, yes, there is this sinophobic component of it where people are like, don't source X things from China or don't source X things from Asia. And it's like, to me, because you don't understand the full history of, of how, we have so much to learn from this culture that have, has been using these mushrooms for thousands of years, then it is just, it, it's just a little mind blowing and, and hypocritical to me. And so I think everybody should learn the full story because we have so much to respect from other cultures. And yeah, I, I can start, I can start talking about that. So Simran, you and I can go on and on and on about going on about that erasure, but I'll, I'll start with kind of on a more positive note about talking about the history of medicinal mushrooms and Chinese culture in general. Um, so I guess I'll start with like the first mushroom that's ever been cultivated or known to be cultivated. So the first mushroom that's ever been known to be cultivated was in 200 BCE. So thousands, thousands of years ago. Um, and it was the wood ear mushroom. And if you, if you're not really familiar with the wood ear mushroom, it is a gourmet mushroom heavily used in Asian cooking, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese cooking. Um, and since then, there's been a long history of, of um, people in China cultivating mushrooms. And I don't even want to say exclusively people of China, because that region of China, it also overlaps with India. It also overlaps with parts of, you know, Tibet as well, and, and Northeast India and Korea. So that kind of global south, um, that was, that's the first documented history of people on this earth cultivating mushrooms. Um, and since then, the, there have been, you know, hundreds of different textbooks within Chinese culture during the Qing dynasty, during the Tang dynasty of um, documentation of medicinal herbs and lines, main and rishi have been in those books that have been documented for centuries. So yeah, this is, this has been a really, really long standing history and kind of like adoration of of these mushrooms um from the chinese and korean and and um, tibetan people for for thousands of years i'm curious to know when when people come to you and ask about mushrooms and what you were sharing earlier around like i don't want this if it originated in china how do you respond it's a really tough way it's a it's a tough way to, to it's a tough thing to think about 
because people never really want the long-winded answer, but I try to give the long-winded answer, which is, you know, look, if you're saying this because you want to support local and you want to support businesses that's strictly sourced from local, to me, there's nothing wrong with that. But if there's a component of assuming that something from another country is dirty, then there's definitely, there's definitely sinophobic roots to that. And topped on with the fact that we know that the origins of medicinal mushrooms, really, they started from Asia. That is the most frustrating part. Um, and the answer is long-winded because I think it takes a while to kind of like, oh, I see Cecilia wrote in the chat, Moore, which is like, that's like the Mandarin characters for Whittier. So <laughs> yes, Cecilia, Moore. Um, but like, yeah, it, it is a long-winded answer. And I think that it's just going to take a while to change people's minds, to be completely honest, because they they re they already have these notions of like, you know, of of sinophobia essentially. And and it's been brought on by COVID. It's been brought on by like inherent bias and racism. It's it's been brought on by a lot of things that have been exacerbated by COVID. But I like to answer people from like a science perspective. For instance, um I I you know, I occasionally go to different mushroom festivals and I give talks and people ask like, okay, like what is the root of this kind of um, assumption that metal, that certain mushrooms from China have heavy metals in them. And we need to be careful about sourcing mushrooms from China. Cause that's like, it's not just that they're dirty. It's that people think that they have people in the science world even think that they have heavy metals in them. So I like to kind of go from a science background and say, okay, like, why do you think that's an assumption and kind of work from there? And so if we really were to go in and kind of explain it, um, how do heavy metals get in mushrooms in the first place? Firstly, heavy metals get mushrooms from locally foraged mushrooms in their environment because mushrooms become this kind of like vessel for the absorption of waters and minerals from the earth if the water and the runoff from the earth most likely the runoff contain heavy metals then the mushrooms will absorb that into their cell walls so what parts of the world might have runoff with heavy metals in them well industrial areas anywhere like literally anywhere so um if you forage for mushrooms specifically only foraged mushrooms, um, and you forage from areas that have like heavy industrial runoff, then the mushrooms might have a little bit of heavy metals in them as they're kind of absorbing everything that's been processed down. Now, this isn't like, it, it, it would be crazy to suggest that this is only a Chinese thing, right? It, it, it could happen anywhere. It can happen in Europe. It can happen in New York City. Like, it's just mushrooms specifically that you've picked from the natural environment mushrooms that are grown in a laboratory setting in my opinion and anybody who works in cultivation there's just absolutely no way like there's there's no way that that would happen because the water source that you would use would be natural because the ingredients that you would use have very very standardized so yeah that's my only explanation for it and that kind of if you go into the science of like why and what's exactly happening then you can kind of parse down and and kind of break away those like sinophobic ideas there's a resonant conversation that happens in cacao and, you know, cocoa around heavy metals, cadmium specifically. And there's also, it's naturally occurring. There are some of these metals that are in soils. And so these are the things that get overlooked. Um, I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about your favorite mushroom stories, but before I do that, just cause you touched on production. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when we see those mushroom kits, including the ones that your company forage sells, how are those put together? Like, what are people getting the substrate? Like, can you just talk about the mycelia, the substrate, all of that? Yeah, absolutely. So when you order a mushroom kit, um, the company that has produced that mushroom kit, whether it be from us or from North Spore or whatever kind of company that you find, um, they've done all of the cultivation work for you. And what that means is that they've taken a specific mycelial bio biomass um, that is a specific clone of mycelium. They've spread it out in a Petri dish, and then they've taken that and spread it out on something called grain to make grain spawn. And that's when the mycelium have fully taken over this very sterile grain and become this like 
dense mass called grain spawn. And then that grain spawn is shaken up further and distributed into something called fruiting blocks. So fruiting blocks are the, the medium in which the, the mycelium of that species like to fruit from. And so if you're or ordering lion's mane or oyster mushrooms, they fruit from hardwood substrate. So it's this hardwood substrate that's been that's been pasteurized, that's been, you know, taken up to the ideal moisture. And then eventually you take that um, grain spawn and you distribute it and you shake it up in those bags. And then that's been given time to kind of slowly colonize or ferment in those bags for for I want to say anywhere from seven to 10 days, seven to, to 14 days. And then after that, um, I have an example for you. The, the bag, so the bag, <laughs> um, it becomes fully covered in this like white, and this is this is Rishi. So Rishi often takes on like a little bit of a brown tinge, but this white biomass essentially. And so when you order a kit, it's just a bag full of this white, dense mycelial biomass that is completely taken over the entire fruiting medium. And what you do is just, you just slice it so that the mycelium becomes kind of like open to air. And once the mycelium senses that oxygen and that air, immediately what it wants to do is start fruiting mushrooms. Um, just because the, the actual organism is mycelium. And the fruiting body, the mushrooms itself, that's the reproductive organ. And these species have been around, around for millennia, you know, so they're, they're fully used to sensing um, specific triggers in the environment in order to propagate their life cycle. So it's, it's as soon as you make that tiny slit within a few days, you're going to start to see mushrooms bud. And this one, this one is, this one is a reishi that we've got. Um, yeah. Yeah. Air is it's air and light, right? Those are the triggers. Air, light, and I don't even want to say humidity is a trigger. Humidity is a necessity in order for it to grow. So you keep spraying it to maintain that humidity, but the air and the light is a trigger for it to grow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to just encourage anyone who has not maybe foraged or you know, feels like they don't they don't know what they're doing enough to forage. My relationship with mushrooms grew so much when I started to see and feel mycelia and the time, like you're going to skip this process if you get the kit, but when you see this, the time it takes, like mushrooms, I think are also a lesson in time because like you were saying, Jennifer, very quickly, the fruiting body will sprout up. And I mean, over hours, you'd see these things grow, or at least with the ones that I cultivated, um, and it was really humbling. Like, you know, there's just so much beauty there and there's, there's just so much to learn. I mean, I like named my mushrooms after my favorite poet yeah. and, I just, you know, go out and check on Padre Gotuma and, you know, it's just like really, really, um, really fun. So, um, it yeah. is really fun. And the grow kit process really mimics the process in the wild. Like if you've ever gone on the same path to walk every single day or every single week and you see a bark you know, you know, like a stump of log and then you see mushrooms the next day, they could be gone or the day before there could be nothing there. And the next day you could see like a massive flush. Like it really is that quick. And, and that's what the grow kit, um, kind of experience experience is mimicking. It, it mimics, um, the mycelium breaking through the bark of a log. And that's when you cut it open. That's kind of like the mycelium breaking open the bark. And then as soon as it senses the oxygen starting to, starting to fruit. Hey, you're making me want to get some more. Do that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, will you, since we, we started doing a little show and tell, will you talk a little bit more about um, some of your favorites? Yeah, so I can definitely talk about that. Um, the first one I kind of want to start off with is cordyceps. If anybody's ever heard of the mushrooms cordyceps before, firstly, I could go on about cordyceps. It's really fascinating. The species and the scientific background itself is um, cordyceps actually classifies as a group of different types of mushrooms. It can be Ophiocordyceps senescens or it could be Cordyceps militaris, but there are specific species of fungi that fully colonize insects and they create these zombie insects. So an example of it is Ophiocordyceps senescens. Um, they they feed on you know what i'll start with militaris militaris feeds on ants and ants specifically um 
as soon as they're exposed to the living ants in the colony, the ant itself starts kind of being brainwashed. I don't know if this is like the, the perfect term scientifically from my scientific background. I want to use different words, but I'm just going to say it for layman's terms. So, so the insect becomes brainwashed into believing that they should leave the hive. So they leave the hive and they climb up to a tree, essentially, um, or they climb up on really, really high back, um, like a high kind of like backdrop. And then eventually, by the time they get to like a really, really tall um, height, it's co been completely brainwashed to the point where it's essentially mummified by by this mycelium and it turns the whole body turns white and then it's essentially dead and by then the mushroom grows out of the body or the head of this insect be it um a, um like an ant or a caterpillar and it just looks like a little like spindly little cheese it essentially it's like bright orange and then because it's kind of brainwashed this insect to climb to a tall height then it spreads its spores and it kind of falls down into like a higher kind of ground so that it can cover more mass and then more insects get um get zombified and this is the one that you wanted to lead with why <laughs> yeah because it's so funny and interesting how certain mushrooms can be totally toxic and detrimental to, let's say, insects, but be beneficial for us. So this type of mushrooms, um, cordyceps, it was first discovered in Tibet um, by Tibetan nomads who they saw, you know, they saw their, the story is that the, they saw their kind of like yaks um, because they were yak herders. They saw their yaks behaving really differently um, after they've kind of, um, you know, like gone to a, a new area and covered, like gone to like higher kind of territory altitude that they haven't foraged for before. And they seen their yaks that they were herding essentially become a lot more energetic, kind of like proliferating, fornicating, just behaving really strangely. So then they went on to investigate what the hell was happening. And they found that the source of it was that the yaks were eating this like bright orange cheese it on the ground and that was the mushroom essentially cordyceps so they were like oh let me just try this and that was the story of like how people of tibet have been taking the cordyceps mushrooms for essentially thousands and thousands of years as an aphrodisiac as a way to increase energy as a way of increasing sex drive so i've kind of given you like the scientific story of like how it's turned into how it's completely mummified an insect but it, it can it for us and for the yaks it's a supplement it's an energy supplement and now they're doing so much research in china and all across the world about cordyceps and what novel compounds are in the cordyceps that cause us to kind of like increase sexual energy and increase athletic performance because there have been studies on specific athletes who've been using cordyceps or kind of like taking cordyceps as supplements who have increased athletic performance specifically for it. Um, and the reason why is because there's a novel compound in cordyceps called cordycepin and is a derivative of something in all of our bodies called ATP. And ATP is a compound that all of our cells use in order to take in sugar and produce energy. And cordycepin is just ATP, but slightly modified. So as our bodies and as we eat cordyceps, our bodies process that cordycepin and then it gets turned into ATP and that's literal molecular energy. And this, I mean, it's just reminding me also of just like how everything is relationship. And isn't it something like we share 50% of our DNA with mushrooms? Is that correct? Yeah, we share a large amount of our DNA with mushrooms. Yeah. yeah. Um, what around sort of the mushrooms that you're talking about, I can see clearly the, the straight line back to Asia. Are there any other mushrooms that, that kind of that have that again, that straight line that are, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I also in line with what we were talking about with cordyceps, um, the name in Tibetan is Yarbugatsu. And then that kind of translates to, um, Dong. I want to, I want to say it right. And I'm sorry, cause I know that we've got Asian and Chinese listeners in the background, but I, my, the, basically it's Dong, Dong Chong something like that but basically it translates to winter um winter grass summer worm 
So it's kind of like really poetic. And I'm sure that there is an Indian name for like, there's, there's some kind of name in like, I, I'm sure in all of those cultures, they're, they're all kind of overlapping. So it's amazing to me. I have family members who like are now have immigrated to the United States and grew up in the hills in Manali in India. And now they know how to forage. Like this was just something that was so endemic um, to culture that of course, you know, you know, which, mm, which mushrooms are the right ones to take. And I have an extraordinary fear of foraging because the, the common refrain I've heard growing up in the United States is those things can kill you. Right. So yeah, better just get them from the grocery store. Um, so yeah. What do you think of that? What I say to that is yes, there are certain mushrooms that can produce quite like can produce harm essentially and poison you. Mm -hmm. But the percentage of that is so, so slim. And we were told it's been a societal thing. Like mushrooms can kill you. Just be scared. Like plants that we can, that we forage for are just as likely to kill us. But for some reason, we don't have that fear with plants, which is really interesting. And I think it all stems, I think it's all generational. I think it's all cultural. I think it stems from Western society. What's interesting, and we can talk about like the anthropological history of this for ages, but what I was looking into was essentially um, in Europe, there were what people would call witches, and it's really just herbalists, female herbalists, but due to religion, Catholicism, all of that, patriarchy. Um, the, yeah, the patriarchy, um, religious institutions started becoming really, really threatened by these female herbalists. So they started the witch hunt. And a lot of these female herbalists, they had serious knowledge of mushrooms. They had knowledge of which mushrooms to forage for, which mushrooms were, were healthy, which mushrooms could heal you. But because thousands, like a staggering amount of these female herbalists were kind of chased down and killed and burned at the stake, we lost all of that mushroom knowledge. And since then, there has been this kind of like my mycophobia among like certain European populations is kind of like carried over through colonialism to North America. That's my explanation for it. That's yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting. It's just sort of, again, underscoring that these are, these are decisions made by cultures, right? I think about even some yes. seeds, you know, seeds are something we spit out that we didn't want to choke on. And it's like every precious thing in a plant is held in the seed, you know, but they were things that people thought to discard and and then there's like a kind of a, a returning to the to the reverence for for all the riches that you know the non-human world has has provided. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. curious to know what are the biggest influences from Asia on North American like culture, you know, mushroom culture and cultivation. I think that everything that Western culture now deems as trendy and calls functional mushrooms, so like reishi, cordyceps, lion's mane, they have all been used prolifically in Asian culture and specifically in Chinese culture for thousands of years. Like what we call reishi, reishi is actually the Japanese pronunciation of, um, or the Japanese translation, excuse me, of lingju, which is like um, this mushroom right here. Um, and reishi, or lingju has been used in Chinese culture for thousands of years. This is probably the most popular mushroom in China. There have been ancient scrolls and art that has been created from reishi. Like the emperor, I think of the Qing dynasty had specific people that he would like, he had hired to like hunt for and forage for this mushroom because they called it the mushroom of immortality. And there would be specific like art that dates back to like, I don't know, like the, er like the earliest centuries essentially where this mushroom was like, basically painted as like the bridge between heaven and earth. And it was understood that this mushroom was going to give you eternal life. Um, and it's been this fascination in Chinese culture with this mushroom for, it's been a love story for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting because it's not just used as medicine as well. There are specific species of reishi, like this one right here, reishi multiplium that can grow like you know, tens of feet. Um, so this one's all dried up. 
But if I had kind of had like a larger biomass, mycelial biomass, and I kind of kept it to a light source, this thing could grow like 10 feet essentially. And there are specific artists in Asian culture who are called like Rishi artists who play around with oxygen and light in their environment to kind of, because these antlers right here, they kind of, they move in response to light and they move in response to oxygen. So if the artist can manipulate the light and the oxygen, then they can get the antlers to kind of go in specific directions. And if you can imagine like 10 feet of that, it's, it's really beautiful and really fascinating. Like, and it's like so interwoven. I mean, what you're talking about transcends medicine, transcends food, and is just like part of culture. But I'm curious, you mentioned lion's mane as well. What's mm -hmm. the longer story of lion's mane? Lion's mane is really interesting. Lion's mane has been used. I, I like to think of lion's mane. I mean, lion's mane has been used in all across all different cultures, but my favorite story of lion's mane is that there's certain sect of Buddhism, Buddhist monks in Japan that, um, they, they lion's mane grows in, in high altitudes and in the high mountains of all across the world but in these job in this area in japan specifically buddhist monks have forged for lion's mane and then they've taken this lion's mane and they made a tea before prayer and then they would drink this lion's mane tea before prayer as a way to like increase focus and increase cognition and and help them like achieve this like meditative state um and they love this mushroom so much that like even their prayer robes re resembled the, the mushroom itself, which is so fascinating. I mean, this is reminding me, and I mean, this is a question I'm just throwing out there, answer or not, but I'm curious to know if any of these um, mushrooms facilitated extraordinary states of consciousness, like did they have some sort of psychedelic quality to them? I would say for the what we classify as functional mushrooms so like reishi cordyceps sorry for anybody who's um who's listening in right now there's like i i live in vancouver city and there's some ambulance going on out there i don't know if you can hear it but anyways um <laughs> for the functional mushrooms so like for cordyceps reishi and lion's mane and similar i don't necessarily think there are any psychedelic states precisely but there are different mushrooms other than magic mushrooms that have been revered in different cultures around the world that do achieve psychedelic states. And the first thing that comes to mind, especially after segueing from lion's mane and, and the kind of like monk costumes that they would wear is um, Emanata as muscaria. So you would probably think of it as like the classic red mushroom with white white um specks on them and that's like called a death cap but really it's been taken in Siberia and specific Siberian tribes for hundreds of years um and that one has been used and taken in small doses to achieve a psychedelic state and a lot of these tribes and these Siberian tribal women they would wear this like like costume like a red cap and like white with white dots on it to kind of like mimic the mushroom essentially i mean indigenous indigenous cultures have stewarded these sacred plants yes the sacred fungi and of course like in the psychedelic tradition all that you know central south america has yes the world so grateful um so great and that's another conversation of course because as the psychedelic industry becomes commercialized, as it becomes, you know, what the cannabis industry was a few years ago, we have to think about, you know, the idea that we're made to think that psychedelics, they're a new thing, when really there have been indigenous cultures that have been using psychedelic mushrooms in a very, very sacred way, in an honorable way for thousands of years. And if we don't understand that history, I just think that we're doing it a little bit of an injustice, to be honest. Agreed. A, a lot, or maybe a lot of an injustice. A lot of injustice. So, yeah, yes. Exactly. <laughs> Not only to, to the sacred cultures and the mushroom, but to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so short changing. There's so much we miss when we don't know these long stories. Um, and I want to know before we move to like um, group questions, you'd mentioned at the start about sort of that 
that shame that you had, you know, when your parents were offering like all of these remedies, home remedies, and you're like, where's the real medicine? I mean, that's my words, not yours. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Those were my words as well. <laughs> like how, like, look at you now. I'm just curious, like what your family, what their response has been and, and how you kind of feel, you know, decades yeah, later. Yeah. I think my mom thinks it's funny. Cause she's like, I told you so. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, you did tell me so. Um, <laughs> But I think that shame is very real for first generation immigrants. Um, I think, you know, anyone who has grown up in the U.S. and has felt othered and has come from like an immigrant background where they have certain traditions that fall off the norm and they're made to believe that those traditions are strange or something that they should really just not embrace. I, I just think, um, you know, I I feel a lot less shameful about my shame because I think that it is a perfectly natural outcome of growing up in the U.S. being a non-white person essentially but um but now I look back and I'm like I think I'm I'm meant to be where I am right now so I'm glad you are where you are and I feel like <laughs> as an immigrant I hear you I hear you and it's you know it's something everyone who had like that that stinky food that people were like, what is that? And now it's like, look at everybody loving on that food. It's look so trendy now, <laughs> right? On that medicine. Exactly. So I'm proud of, I'm proud of being Asian. Um, I, I would love to know as, as we transition as the last question, what would you like folks to remember the next time they forage or purchase or consume a mushroom? Well, going back to our conversation about the history of these sacred medicines in specific cultures all across the world, like, I think it begs the question, and I, I don't want to be the person to say, no, you can't, like, you can't consume this mushroom without knowing X, Y, and Z, or no, I'm not going to, like, I don't want to, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's really, really important to know the history because you can contextualize what's happening in the world right now and kind of recognize when there's hypocr hypocrisy, essentially. You can recognize and, and, and you know where to learn from because all of this isn't new. And it is important to respect different cultures that aren't just the, the global West. Mushroom as metaphor, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be in conversation with you and um, to know that you're helping to like shape the, the sort of the, the, the industry, you know, the market um, as it, as it sort of grows. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to turn over to the chat to see if anyone has any questions here. And while that is happening, while I'm looking, I would love to know, um, Jennifer, for those who like maybe do want to deepen their relationship and connection to mushrooms, is there a particular, I don't know, a particular mushroom that you think is a good, it feels a little bit weird to say, but like <laughs> a good starter mushroom. A good starter mushroom. I guess the question is for what? <laughs> um, if you were to buy a grow kit because you're like, I want to grow mushrooms in my house and I want to eat them, then I think any kind of oyster mushroom would be really easy and delicious. Even a lion's mane mushroom would be, yeah, I would say an oyster mushroom or a lion's mane would be really easy to grow and delicious. I think if you're interested in mushrooms as medicine um, and as a supplement to take daily, um, it really depends on what, like if you have indigestion issues, chaga has been my go-to. If you have anxiety and sleep issues, um, I would say reishi is incredible. And if you have ADHD, like myself, lion's mane is really good for focus. Taking some notes. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any books or zines or writers or speakers that you would suggest for folks who want to learn more? Ooh, I really, really like, um, I believe it's called Our Entangled Life or Entangled Life. Um, I can drop it on in the chat, actually. Here, Is that the book by it. Merlin Sheldrake? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Entangled yeah. Life, Merlin. It's, yeah, it's by Merlin Sheldrake. It's 
called Entangled Life. Um, and I'll drop that in right now. Thank you. While you're dropping, I am going to ask Katina's question. With such depth of knowledge, are there things that continue to surprise you? Oh, I love this question. What is mm -hmm. something that has brought you surprise or delight? Thank you, Katina. Um, what is something that has brought me surprise or delight? I really think that this is like mushrooms. There's never, you're never going to know everything. So that's the fun part is that anybody can have some depth of knowledge, but it's all relative and relatively to like the entire, you know, hundreds of thousands of years that fungi have existed. We don't really know anything. Um, <laughs> Let me think about something that was interesting. Okay, so slime mold is no longer categorized as fungi, um, but they were at one point. And um, slime mold is really, really interesting because they share some kind of, they have some kind of intelligence. They have used slime mold to optimize, I believe the New York subway system. They did a kind of like mock um, prototype of the subway system. And then they use slime mold to figure out the quickest path um, to a light source. Uh, slime mold is brilliant. Um, a lot of fungi are brilliant, but, and slime mold technically is no longer fungi, but I love that story. I think it's really fascinating. So do I, I love that again, like fungi intelligence. We think we're up here, but we are not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, I will also say, Oh God, like I can go on. So something that has brought me surprise or delight. I think that fire fungi are really fascinating as well. There are specific sect, a sector of fungi that, um, that can grow and colonize or kind of like prosper uh, with no nutrients just on pure charcoal. And scientists have recently gone to forest fires after the forest fires have broken out and turned everything into ash. And there is absolutely no life on, on, the, on the ground, except in a few days, you can see little fire mushrooms, fire fungi popping up. And they are absolutely crucial to the remediation of, of our land after a forest fire. Um, so I think that's really, really fascinating. It's beautiful. That's, there's so much there, um, metaphorically around resilience and, you know, yes. I, I'm loving it. Uh, growing up, MC asks, what was the natural method you used to consume the three types of mushrooms? So I'm imagining cordyceps, lion's mane, and reishi. Um, yeah, so I think in traditional Chinese medicine, there's this idea that everything you eat, um, it isn't just going to, it should, it shouldn't just be delicious. It should be good for you. And that's like the principle is that everything has some kind of benefit to your overall health and a very specific benefit. So in consuming specific types of functional mushrooms that might not be like the most delicious, but serve some purpose, kind of just like sliced up in broth or bone soup would be really good. Um, or just like tea. Yeah. Thank you. Do you, um, can you talk more? This is another great question. These are fantastic. Can you talk more about the connection between generational loss of mushroom knowledge and colonizing methods of violence? Um, I'm curious about what Mora means by colonizing methods of violence. What do you think, Simran? Do you want to unmute Mora and, and um, clarify? Uh, my apologies. Oh, um, so sorry. Um, yeah, you were talking about how during the um, like Catholic invasion kind of the, I would yes. classify that a little bit about like colonization method of violence, like using this ideology of God as this supreme being, you know, kind of a colonial ideology of like singularity, like, yeah, God is like everything. Thing. And if you don't follow that, you know, if you don't follow our ways, you know, you're a threat. And so, like, um, I was just wondering if you could talk more about that or other examples you knew um, similar to that. I think that's probably the biggest and most violent 
um, an extreme example, although I think that loss of knowledge um, due to like ignorance and xenophobia and sexism happens gradually and everywhere. But I think that's probably one of the most extreme examples, at least when it pertains to mushrooms. Um, I myself am not like an expert on this, but I think it's really fascinating. The whole idea of like what the Catholic church classified as witches and this whole idea of like a witch hunt, because um, it really was like so random and it really had to do with specifically women who possessed herbal medicinal knowledge of where to forage because that's the women carried that kind of knowledge during those times and how they were a threat to the intelligent force of the church who essentially deemed like it was like let's say there was like somebody who was like falling ill um, the church would go and they would say like, oh, we have to perform this on you. We have to pray for you. We have to do this. And then you'd have the female herbalist who would say like, no, you, this person just needs to take this herb and they'll be totally fine. And because that was like a threat to the kind of like validity of the church, that's why, in my opinion, a lot of these witch hunts happened. And because the witch hunts happened, we lost so much herbal knowledge and so much mushroom knowledge um, during that time. And there was this kind of like overall mycophobia during that time that was specifically tied to the church and tied to like fear of witches, essentially, or what they would call witches. And we think I guess, like all of these, anything that we do ourselves without like the capitalist system is a threat to that system now so it's like yeah now um gosh thank you for that I I've got a couple questions about Asian culture and mushrooms specifically is there a book that you'd recommend about the history of mushrooms in Asian culture and where can Ooh. we learn about the earliest records of wood ear cultivation that you had mentioned yeah I wish that there was a book specifically now and there might be but I I'm not aware of it um the book that I'm referencing, um, there's like a lot of different forms of this book, but it's called um, Shen Nong Ben Cao Jing. Um, and it's like called the Divine Farmer's Material Medica. And there have been a <coughs> lot of different versions that have been published um, throughout the last thousands of years in China. And it essentially, here, let me just... Yeah, it's um, and it's about specific medicinal, um, medicinal. I'm just gonna drop it in the chat. Medicinal mushrooms that um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, there you go. Thank you for that. Um, she already put it in the chat, but yes, the the materia medica. What at the supermarket and um, when when you're at the supermarket and looking to buy mushrooms for food, what do you look for? Freshness, question marks, laughing emoji. <laughs> well, I guess because I work like, and my company is specifically a grow kit company, I get, I'm very spoiled and I see the mushrooms in the supermarket. And if I, I don't want to like lecture anybody, but I just, and I think it's always great to support local, of course, but a lot of these mushrooms have been shipped and then have been sitting there and then have been shipped to the grocery store again and then have been sitting there and then have been put in the shelves and then they've essentially been there for a really really long time so you can kind of see them getting like a little scraggly and moist and old so I think a grow kit is the best way or your local farmer's market is the best way to purchase mushrooms um any fresh mushrooms are delicious Sometimes I like to buy dried mushrooms. I like to go to like the Asian grocery store and buy like dried wood ear and then rehydrate them. There's also, you can buy dried bamboo fungus, um, phallus induciatus, um, and that is a really delicious mushroom in hot pot. Look at this, we're moving into recipes. I wanna upload, yeah. I think it's really important in case folks missed it. Um, Cecilia said, I also think the Chinese Communist Party has contributed much to uprooting people and traditions and erasure of knowledge burning books. And yes. Yeah, absolutely. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I read this really great book by Linda Rufung called Swimming Back to Trout River. And it's about 
the Chinese Communist Party and how they've essentially during that time, and it was a crazy time, they like burned books and they like stoned people who were essentially academics and people who were bourgeoisie, so not directly contributing to the prosperity of the country by being an engineer or a mathematician or a scientist. And because of that kind of academia, so anybody who loves something just wanted to study it because they found it fascinating. They, yeah, a lot of that knowledge was completely eradicated, mushrooms probably included. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for your your, just your care and your thoughtfulness. I, I've learned so much this evening and I'm so, so grateful that you took time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming and for listening to this. This has been really lovely. And thank you so much, Simran and Sari. Thank you. Thank and you both. Too. Sorry, I'm going to jump in. This doesn't exist without y'all. So thank you for showing up. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to put also in the chat the the final part of the series, which is in January, just out of the link. And Simran, why don't you just quickly, can you give us like a little preview of what to expect for that one? Absolutely. So this series has been, you know, the broad theme has been like sort of understanding and um, the, the sacred mushroom. I like to always, they're all sacred and, and looking at how we decolonize them. So Carlos Baca um, is an extraordinary um, native activist and chef who will be speaking about uh, mushrooms in North America on Turtle Island and, um, and a lot of what's happened around uh, colonization and around attempts to you know, honor and preserve first foods. So I hope you'll join us. That's in mid-January, yeah? Um, yep, it's January 19th. 19th, don't say 9th. Yep, um, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. <laughs> Um, wonderful. Well, Jennifer, thank you. It was, it was really an honor to have you and meet you. And Simran, as always, thank you so much for your thoughtful, beautiful moderation. And for this series, of course, it would not have happened um, without you conceiving of it. So we're so grateful for you. Um, and so everyone, I think I think that's actually, this is our last program of 2022. Ah, um, we only did three this week. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm gonna gonna go sleep now until until 2023. Um, so we'll see you in the new year. Happy holidays, whatever you are celebrating. Um, we're we're grateful for you for being part of our community, and we wish you all the best for a very happy, joyous, safe new year. And hope to see you soon, uh, early 2023, and definitely on January 19th. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.